what up what up what up what up what up everybody it is your boy bq welcome back to the negative bq youtube channel this is your impact lounge impact wrestling review for november 7 2024 thanks for swinging back by as always i haven't been plugging the channel a whole lot lately but if it is your first time here consider hitting that subscribe button we talk tna impact every week and depending on the time of the year i'm going to give you a lot more content than this this is one of my busy periods of the year and um we're just kind of reviewing impact every week and when i get the opportunity i love to do opinion pieces mailbags um, things of that nature but right now we're just kind of reviewing the episode every week and it's probably going to be that way through the rest of the year I've been on active duty the last couple months, and I'm going to be through the year, maybe January, which is nice for my rest because I kind of work in regular hours and I'm able to get pretty quality sleep. But, you know, I work hour and a half away with the commute, coming home, making dinner and everything. It is pretty difficult for me to to make daily content, but I can review the show pretty easily. Once I get back to my normal job, um, my contract ended there, so I don't have to work the overnight hours I was previously. Um, so we'll just see <laughs> when I get back to work what happens with that and what, what my schedule looks like. But um, if you like an honest review of the show, this is the place to be for that. I'm always going to speak very honestly. If something's good, I'll say it's good. If it's bad, I'm going to say it's bad. I do not get along with the TNA marks. I get along with the TNA fans, the super fans. The ones who want to see the company improve, the show improve, the company grow. But those who are like the diehards, the the the, um, the ones who watch, you know, Explosion on Thanksgiving instead of hanging out with their family, like we're we're not the same. So, um, if you're one, of, if if you're a Mark, you may not li like what I have to say. Um, but if you're a very open-minded fan, want to see this company get better and and can admit to yourself when something they're doing is not good and and when it doesn't work then man this is the place for you so let's get into this episode here um i thought i thought the show was it was probably a middle of the pack show i kind of liked it but one of the things that i always base my reviews off and and how much i i like or dislike a show is how easy it is to consume and how just how quickly it feels like this show, this show, did I say how quickly it feels? This show flew by for me. And I don't know if they, I didn't go back and look at the timestamp. I don't know if they took 10, 15 minutes off the show because they removed the Hardys match uh, with Chris Bay and Ace Austin. I think it was a tag match where he got hurt. I know that they filled in the blanks a little bit on this episode with some content, but the show to me felt like it flew by. There was a couple weeks ago, and I don't remember what show it was in particular. I just felt like it was it was never going to end. I kept thinking, oh, that was the main event. And, and then it was just like another match and another match. And I was just like, sometimes I'm watching a show and it feels like it's four hours long. This one um, really, really flew for me. And by the time it got to the main event, I was like, oh, damn, this is, this is already over. So I typically enjoy episodes that are like that. And this was a really knockout heavy episode. The matches weren't necessarily that good, but it, it was different because it, we were missing some of the normal characters that we see every week. So the show felt a little fresher. We didn't get PCO nonsense on here. Um, you know, it was it was just a little bit different. But it was very knockout heavy and it uh, kicked off with a tag team match. Well, no, it kicked off with Tom Hannafin yelling at us. Um, it took him about five seconds into the episode to say bound for glory and then it took him another five seconds to get their obligatory um camera shot of william gardner on screen which uh nothing against him he, he's a nice guy i've chatted with him before on twitter and he held up a sign for me one time on tv and um i actually met him once a long time ago before i was a podcaster so he doesn't remember that but um not a shot at him but it's just like okay tna cameraman you we understand you have a fan. I, we get it. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is years of this <laughs> opening the fucking show. Anyway, 
Uh, it kicks off with a knockout tag team match. Uh, this includes Tasha Steeles. Got a badass over here. And her partner, Alicia Edwards. Uh, hi, baby. And they took on Jordan Grace. And the knockouts world champion, Masha Slamovich. Meet Fran Stalinaskovich Davidovitsky. And this match is exactly what you think it would be. The two top female wrestlers in the company wrestling against the two not top female wrestlers in the company. Now, with that said, I think Tasha Steeles is the best knockout in TNA. And I mean as far as the full package. From the music, the entrance, the promos, the wrestling, the aura, everything about her. To me, she's the best knockout. That does not mean I think she's the best wrestler or she was the best one of the best champions ever. That's not that's not what I'm saying. Um, but this match is is what you expected it to be. I thought it was a little too competitive, though. Like it was a little. But at the same time, I don't want to see these two squashed. It's just kind of an unrealistic matchup, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It made something competitive that really shouldn't have been. But at the same time, you don't want to see him squashed because. They probably got to find a way to make Alicia and Tasha number one contenders for the tag team titles at some point. So you don't want to just like, you know, completely squash them. Alicia still wrestles with the neck brace, even though she's taken it off before. And, um, you know, the match was quick and painless. You start off with two of the biggest female stars in the company. They get the win. She gets a rear naked choke on Alicia. I'm sure at some point here, uh, Masha Slamovich is going to have to defend the title against Alicia, uh, defend it against Tasha Steeles, and then by the time Genesis comes, she'll probably wrestle um, Jordan Grace again. This feud, it's not a feud. There's no heat whatsoever between Jordan and and uh, Masha. Just, I mean, just a couple weeks ago, they had like two weeks of blood feud and then had a good match and went back to being best friends. And that's what we're going to get. I think when it's Jordan Grace's send off officially, it's just going to be two best friends having a match, which I, I guess is fine. I mean, that's kind of what I thought they were going to do a Bound for Glory anyway before they decided to put some heat in there at the last minute, which I was very critical of, but I thought it worked when it was all said and done. So uh, Alicia and Tasha are going to be kind of placeholder challengers just to get us to. <laughs> the big pay-per-view. So I think that's um pretty obvious right there. And she shouldn't have too difficult of a time beating any of them. I want to say about um Jade's ring announcing. Just just stop and listen to how much she has improved. If you remember when they brought her on, she was doing explosion and you know she did a couple matches here or there and she just had no bass in her voice. No, no energy. Like she was trying. She was giving it the old call as try. Like there was effort, but it was, you know, her voice almost sounded empty. Like it sounded hollow. Like it just had nothing, no juice to it. Listen to her ring announcing now. She is killing it. Uh, I was just really going out of my way to pay attention to it because I used to say about Dave Penzer all the time. I was like, he announces every single fucking wrestler exactly the same. Cruise bang. Austin. I mean, everything was the same. Everything. Every every wrestler. And if they were a jobber, they got the same energy that the main eventers got. You know, like it was just you guys know I was just going crazy over his ring announcing. She's she's really good. She's doing a she's doing a really, really good job. I mean, just go just pay attention next episode to how she's doing this stuff. Like she's really coming into her own. And you know, I was um when they had Sam Turner around. I always knew she was a good backstage interview, a backstage ring announcer, and I wanted her to take over for Gia backstage. But I was even thinking, man, maybe she'd be a better ring announcer than Jade. But once I listened to Sam do Maple Leaf Pro, I'm like, Jade is a lot better than her. So um, much, much love. Speaking of Gia Miller. Jesus Christ, that's perfect. Of course you're here right now. She was backstage with Savannah Evans. That's a huge bitch. We've never heard Savannah Evans speak before, at least not to my knowledge, and I think we know why now. This was 
it was quick and painless. It wasn't a long promo. Um, but these were two bad actors taking up TV time for a little bit. Well, I'm glad they're doing something with Savannah Evans right now, but I think it would behoove them for her, her to be the strong silent type. Up next, more knockouts action. We had Wendy Chu. It doesn't even go here. And she took on Rosemary. I know Down what there. cankles are. Rosemary doesn't have them. They were best friends for the last several months. Uh, Rosemary speared her. I think I'm bound for glory, right? Yeah, I was at the pay-per-view. Rosemary spears her, and it is now two weeks later, uh, a blood feud enough to do no disqualification. Um, my favorite, right? Garbage matches. Good, but because there's two characters that the fans seem to enjoy, and, and they've got characters to them, like, what are we always talking about? How much characters are missing in wrestling? And it doesn't mean everyone has to be spooky and black and dark and the lights go out. That's what I'm saying. But we can get lost in a match a little bit, especially if you guys been around and you're watching wrestling in the you know 80s and um, a little later than that as well. But if you guys remember, like we could we could get away with a match between two people who just had big personalities or they were just characters and what they were doing in the ring was not necessarily good, but we weren't. We weren't analyzing it to that point like we would now. If we just had two ham and eggers having a garbage match, we'd be like, what the fuck is this shit? But, you know, we're, we're kind of able to get, get around it based on, you know, having some interest in the characters. It is a really random feud. It's not even really a feud. It's just an excuse to split them up so that uh, Wendy Chu is not working TNA dates anymore and Rosemary's not working nxt dates like there's a there's a rotation right and you know it's after bound for glory so okay we're gonna rotate these people in these ones out whatever so that's all it was um they were hitting each other with an empty pillowcase oh. and um uh, rosemary won the match so that's it i i thought there was a possibility that rosemary rosemary and wendy two were going to win the titles at some point like clearly that's not going to happen so we'll see what the direction is with Rosemary. I would imagine um, they're just going to kind of tread water with her for a few months. And then when Jordan Grace loses to Masha, probably a Genesis, I think they're going to move on to Rosemary wrestling for the knockouts championship from there. I don't think it's like something that's going to, you know, uh, stretch out to slam anniversary or rebellion or anything like that. But I think that once Genesis is over and then whatever, TNA plus show happens in February. I think there's a good possibility that Rosemary will be the champion at some point there. And then they're going to be like, well, who can we sign that was used to be in WWE or whatever. And then they're going to kind of, kind of move on to, to doing that. Following us, following this, they gave us something from the vault. Never before seen matchup. And when they said Mike Santana was wrestling Mustafa Ali, I was like, no shit. I, I'm I'm immediately interested in this. I'm like, that's a really good match. And then it took me about 10 seconds to be like, this match was never on TV. This match had no build. There is no way that there's a match. Like I you just you can you can feel that. And TNA, there are some good ma matchups that they can put together, but they don't because they don't, they can't, they don't want anyone to beat anyone. You know, that is one area that I have to, that, that, that if I had to say something nice about AEW, that's probably something where they were, they've never been afraid to put two top guys against each other and, and someone beat the other person. They don't throw the match out. They don't have, you know, screwy disqualifications like they're they I mean, they have a completely different style of booking, but they're they're OK with with someone, a top person beating a top person where TNA tries to avoid that at all costs, it seems like. So I knew that this match here, especially with no bill, like I said, I was like, they're not just going to there's there's going to be no finish here. So now I'm kind of like you're wasting my time. 
But then I realized, okay, this is probably taking place of the Hardys versus ABC. So I get it. But these vault matches are not for television. These are for the live audience. And they don't translate to television. Tom Hannafin on commentary. I'm going to do my best not to make any jokes about Tom. Tom. He is saying that this is um, Father's Day. Like he, he, so he said at the time. What? How did he word it? At the time we're recording this, it's Father's Day or something like that. It's clearly they. It's it's clear they went back and and did the commentary, or just they weren't sure when it was going to air. So he made it a point to say it's Father's Day. Well, at least it is at the time of recording or whatever the hell he said. And um, the match was like the commentary in the match was a lot of a lot of joking around. Like the match was not serious from from the beginning to the end. It was Hannafin and Raywall tickling each other's dicks the entire match. And of course, we got you know just a couple seconds of the match. Um, Campaign Singh came in and. And Hannafin had a, all this like fake outrage for campaign saying, I don't remember saying any of these things when this was uh, going on, when this was a thing on TV. I don't remember ha- him having any issues with him. But anyway, they threw out the match very quickly. We get Santino. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. And he has um, announced that this is going to be a tag team match. Mustafa Ali, campaign Singh versus Mike Santana and Joe Hendry. Believe that and i just kind of wanted it to be over and um obviously they they won the henry Sant- uh, santino henry santana team they won and we got the we got out of this we got a nice little video after this of steve macklin i'm not going to play a sound drop because his is kind of long so i only play it when he wrestles but we got him talking i think he was on his cell phone talking about josh alexander so when I said that this episode was different, you know, we just some of the normal, the, the regular characters, the Josh Alexanders, the Macklins, they weren't on TV. Obviously, Macklin was here. He talked for a few minutes. Um, but as far as the matches, the backstage promos, like it was just it was just different. We got some some different faces, which I think is good after Bound for Glory. Um, but I'm really looking forward to what what he is doing. Um, they're going to redo that match. <laughs> Because you remember in the Northern Armory, we're, we're not in um, full effect, so they had the good hands step out. They're good, they are going to redo that match because, I, I mean, it's TNA. They stay the course, like I said. You know, hey, we were supposed to give you this match. We need it for the storyline. We couldn't give it to you. We gave you some bullshit instead with the good hands. Now we're going to actually give you the match, which is which is fine. And then we got um, we got the Rascals backstage. In one word. Would I use dope? Nope. And I know a lot of you guys like the silliness that the Rascals do. You guys like the treehouse. I know the majority of you do. I particularly do not. I've never been high before. I can't relate. They're not even high in, in these segments. It's so To me, it just comes off as silliness and bad acting. And I know it's what works for the Rascals. So that's perfectly fine. I'm not saying, hey, you need to be this serious character all of a sudden. But I think the Rascals get over more when they have some fire to them and they come out and they're serious. To me, that's a better gimmick for them. The matches come off better. You you perceive them as cha- as actual challengers of the championship. Every time they go back to this, I think they're taking steps backwards. That is my personal opinion. I know that probably 99% of you disagree with that because over the years talking to you guys talking on social media reading comments everyone seems to really like like this stuff with the rascals i just don't they gave us a little bit after this um from from after bound for glory showing joe hendry arguing with the nemeth brothers and santino and this is a nice touch because they're finally giving us some heat and it all makes sense because when they had the match at Bound for Glory, a lot of us, myself included, were saying, no heat to this. There's none whatsoever. There's just two baby faces going out there and wrestling. And now, with that being said, I'm kind of like, Joe Hendry is probably not going to win. I don't think he's going to win a, 
um, babyface versus babyface match. So now this makes sense because Joe Hendry lost. Santino's telling him end of the line, which we know is bullshit. And they're, they're going to redo this match. And they're going to build up to this eventual Joe Hendry title win. And it looks like they're going to go uh, the heel route with the Nemeth brothers. I think that's pretty clear. And that that's kind of a that's been a TNA booking thing over the years. You bring in the WWE guy, he he beats everybody, um, then eventually kind of turns heel on the way out the door, and then we don't see him again. Um, you know, they turn heel, drop the title, whatever. So that's I, I think that's pretty obvious. That's where they're going with it. I think that they're just going to have, um, you know, that they were they just felt like hey, there's stages to this. We're going to have the match. There's going to be they're, they're both going to be good guys. <laughs> And Joe Hendry is going to get screwed. And then we're going to build the story from there. We're going to start building the heat from there. And then by the time we get to Genesis, wherever they're going to do this, it is a blood feud. And Nick Nemeth is a heel. And Joe Hendry is the white meat baby face. And he has to overcome the heel. I think that's that's pretty clear that that's where they're going with all that. So that's perfectly fine. I, I have more interest in that than what they were doing at Bound for Glory. But if Bound for Glory is your biggest show of the year, Bound, then why we just having two baby faces hug each other and shake hands in the main event. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but I understand where they're going with it. That's a perfectly fine. And so some of you guys got to realize, cause everyone was so mad that Joe Hendry didn't win the title of bound for glory. They look at what the attendance was for bound for glory. Look what the pay-per-view buys were. You think they're going to blow their load on one show or they're going to try to drag that being said, they cannot drag it out past Genesis. You you drag it past then, it's dead. But I think I think we'll it'll all come to a head at Genesis. Then backstage, Mike Santana That's nasty. was um packing his gear. I guess he was gonna leave in the middle of the show, and he was confronted by first class. But I am telling you right now, that motherfucker that motherfucker back there is not real. And this is what first class does. They come out and they try to recruit people. I mean, that's just that's just what it is. I thought Mike Santana sounded very, very good here as normal, saying, watch the words that you say, you know, when they walk up. Mike Santana is very good. We already know this. And I guess next week we're gonna get Mike Santana versus Casey Navarro. I am very ready for Rich Swan to be back and part of this. And I don't even know that he is. He he may not. It, it, this may be first class going forward. I know the TNA website shows all three of them, but when I'm watching this version on screen, I just have, I, I can't picture Rich Swan involved. That, you know, me personally, I don't know if you, if you guys can or whatever. I, I just personally can't. I hope I'm wrong because the act is a lot better with Rich Swan. Much, much, much better. More knockouts in the action after this. Personal concierge. That's my dad. But don't worry, he's cool. Really? <laughs> it doesn't look cool. And he announces Heather by Elegance. He has an erection. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all her fault. And she's accompanied by Ash by Elegance. Come on, Teddy. Come on, Teddy. And she is taking on Jody Threat, accompanied by Danny Luna. Tell me right now that I'm just a job. Tell me to my face. You're just a job. And th this was another match I wasn't particularly good. They are they are fast tracking the shit out of this knockouts tag team title feud. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the minute they put these girls as a tag team together, it's like, okay, put them in the put them in a a program with Spitfire. Let's get the titles off these transitional ass champions. So they're they're fast tracking the shit out of this. They're one and one right now, 50 50, 50 50 booking. And, and you know, um, Matt Raywall was saying on commentary Hey, man, I really appreciate that Patrick Price on my insurance, Jake from State Farm. He was saying that if Heather wins here, then they're the de facto number one contenders, basically, which is true, except Heather lost. It's 50 50. So now they got to find a way to, they're just going to continue to wrestle each other until they're able to justify some kind of match. I think we're going to probably get it. I don't think we're going to get it at a final resolution. I think we're going to get it at 
the um, my assumption is the TNA Plus show this month, and I think the the titles are going to switch very quickly. And then Ash is going to be Ash and Heather are going to be champions for a very long time because they have nobody to fight. They're probably going to have a rematch with Spitfire. You can't really put them in a program with Tasha and Alicia because they're heels. So that's not really going to be a thing. Hypothetically, you could put Jordan and Masha in a feud with them, and but you put the belts on those girls. They're never, no one's ever beating them. So probably means they're waiting to see who WWE fires so they can bring them in to put a tag team together. Sorry, for some reason, the uh, intro played there. I have no idea why. I tried to pause it before it, so I, I don't know how that came off on the, the podcast, but for some reason, it just played. Anyway, um, Jody Threat, when she um, hit her finisher, that F5, I forgot what she calls it, that was probably the only good one she's ever hit since she's been part of this company. And because Heather, by elegance, weighs 88 pounds, um, that probably is the reason why. But that you, that move usually doesn't look very good. Rosemary used to do it really, really good when she was doing the Red Wedding. That's what it's called, right? Yeah, Red Wedding. That's a, isn't a Game of Thrones reference. When she hit that, that was always nice. Um, when jo- Jody Threat does it, it usually looks like shit, but this one looks really good. I did skip over something. This was before the Santana first class segment. So my apologies. And it was Joe Hendry came out and he was going to present his song about Ryan Nemeth. And he made some jokes for a little bit about getting extra time because he's going to talk about Ryan Nemeth's accolades. The funny things, the funny thing is Ryan Nemeth actually does have some accolades you know he he does do a little bit of acting and i think stunt double was that's where the whole hollywood thing uh, hollywood hunk thing comes from but he did uh the little nick nemeth or excuse me the ryan nemeth song saying he's nick nemeth's brother the end and everyone is cheering for one more time one more time i thought it was funny it was quick and effective goes back to what i said about we just kind of got some different this was a different episode Joe Hendry came out very briefly. He didn't come out and talk for half an hour and all that. He just kind of did what he did to pop the crowd and left. And if, if it's not clear to you that the Nemeth heel turn is coming, this, this showed us because he wouldn't be playing a video like this about Ryan Nemeth if he was going to be a baby face. And earlier in the show, when it showed him backstage, uh, Joe Hendry challenged Ryan Nemeth, which is, Funny because that's when he challenged him, right? I'm trying to go back to the episode. I believe he, he it was when they were arguing. He said, I'll, I'll wrestle you next week or something. But this was filmed like weeks ago. I don't know if they're trying to act like this was after Bound for Glory or if they were act like it was a present argument. I don't, I don't know and I don't really care to be honest with you. I just know that we're going to get Joe Hendry versus Ryan Nemeth. I actually thought Ryan Nemeth was kind of done. You know, he just hasn't been around. I'm not even sure he's still on the the roster page on the company, but we're going to get that. Joe Hendry is obviously going to beat him, and they're going to go some, you know, start this heel turn. I I just think it's very, very obvious. Oh, and I kick out. Main event time. So I'm sorry that I skipped over that earlier. Main event time. We got X Division Championship on the line. Dodge, duck, dip, dive, and the challenger was Moose. Samu Moose. Taking on the X Division champion, Mike Bailey. Cheeseball Mike Bailey, I'm sorry. Jeez. Yeah. Didn't we lock you in the dumpster one time? I got Oh, and I kick out. Um, so this was really, really good. This was the match here that you kind of forget everything that happened on the episode. The wrestling up to this point was not stellar. Again, very, very knockout heavy. And with the, with that, you're going to get decent wrestling. You're not going to get five-star five star classics. This right here was the match. And probably one of the top TV matches they have of the year. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think what some of the other ones are. 
But I think at the end of the year, you know, they're going to say, what is your match of the year? Like, this is going to be up and there. Kick out. And um, Moose wins. Moose is the X Division champion. I don't know that Mike Bailey is around anymore. I, I would imagine they're probably going to try to do a rematch. But, I mean, who knows, you know? Um, Zach Wentz never got his rematch. The Rado kid, God forbid, that guy gets his rematch for the uh, digital media championship. The rematch clause, the contractually obligated rematch is is bullshit, and it is used when they need it. And they very conveniently forget about it at times. So I don't even know if we're going to get this again, because if we didn't get Wentz versus Speedball again, and that was one of the best matches of the year, why, that, why, why would they give us this again? <laughs> you know? I mean, you think there'd be some money in that. Wentz versus Speedball, I believe, a plus show though so this was this was a tna excuse me a tv show i mean a tv match so i'm pretty sure this is going to be one of your top tv matches of the year i really can't think of something else that was in that ballpark uh shout out to tom hannafin for running down moose's accolades and let us know that he is a two-time grand champion so i i should probably start prefacing that every time moose comes of the ring i should let you know that he is a two-time grand champion that's probably probably what i need to do so this match was pretty much perfect the only thing i had with this the only issue i had with it was mike bailey hitting the uh the poison the poison rama on uh, excuse me poison rana on moose and then hitting ultima weapon and moose kicking out i just like for me that is too much. That is that is AEW shit where you're you're pretty much hitting um, a, a move that no one should kick out of first, and then hitting the finisher and getting a two count. Oh, and a kick out. So, so that was the only thing for me personally that I thought was was a little much. I had to laugh at one point, you know, because Moose was kind of working the leg, whatever. Speedball Mike Bailey gets up, and because his knee buckles, he falls down. And how does Tom Hannafin sell it? Oh. So that being said, the match was was really excellent. It was um, it didn't go too terribly long. Like it, it was a really for me, it was just like a a perfect timing. Uh, I mean, perfect length. And Moose is the X Division champion. The system, no pun intended. The system works when someone has a title. It looks like you know, like how is that? How is that stable going to really? Um, exude dominance when no one has any belts, no one has any championships. So I didn't think they were going to go this direction until they made the match. And I said, "Oh, I think I think Moose is going to win this thing." But that that's how the system is going to work going forward. And I think Moose is going to be the champion for a very long time. Before I get into that, let's talk about the end of the match. Moose hits a spear. Mike Bailey rolls out of the ring, and then Moose runs around the corner. Hits another spear on the outside. And then they get back in the ring. Mike Bailey jumped off the second rope, top rope, whatever, gets speared, which I thought should have been the finish of the match, to be honest. And then Moose hits another spear and gets the win. I I have mixed feelings on finishes like this. There's, there's good and bad to it. The bad is that you're kind of burying your finisher when you need four of them to beat somebody. Next guy. Okay, so that that's one of my issues with that. But the good in it was that it was a very dominant win at the end. Like you're just a, you're just assuming that when you know Moose is going to wrestle Mike Bailey, that it's going to be a dusty finish. Because right away at the beginning of the match, it shows both guys in the ring, and then it's the goof ref. You one of those challenge kids? The doctor said I could be on the spectrum. I don't know what that is, but get off of pronto. So right right away, I'm thinking, okay, there's a dusty finish because whenever the goof ref is out there, they're going to do some kind of angle where he looks like an idiot and someone cheats. They did it at the, at the freaking call your shot gauntlet for crying out loud. So that's kind of like where, where I thought it was going to go because the system gets involved in all these fucking matches. Like no one, you know, and Mike Bailey doesn't lose clean. He, he in the whole time he's been in this company, with the exception of Josh Alexander, when they wrestled for like an hour, he doesn't lose clean. 
There's always something, whether it's a tight tight grab or something. So they actually beat Mike Bailey clean here. It took four spears to do it, but Moose won. There was no one, no one at ringside, no nonsense, no fuck finish. Like he just he just flat out beat him. So that is the real, real big positive I want to point out here. That is really, really good. Okay, what I was saying, I think Moose is going to have a very lengthy X Division Championship run because there's no one that in that division that can beat him. They haven't built anyone to beat him. They didn't build anyone to beat Mike Bailey. I know that they're teasing Leon Slater. They're not teasing it, but we, we just kind of feel that he's he's next to really take over the sex division. I don't see him beating Moose at any point because there's so much character progression that he will need between now and then, and I don't know if we're going to get there. He has bad ring gear. We don't know how well he can talk at this point. He's spoken a little bit backstage, but we don't really know. He has bad music. It's it's this stock MP3 that they give everyone who's new. Um, not that exact song, but that that sound. There's a lot they had they have a lot they got to do with Leon Slater. I just don't see him in a one-on-one feud with Moose because for Moose to lose this title, he's not going to lose it in some random X division match. There's not going to be Ultimate X and or a number one contender six way, and the person wrestles Moose and wins. Like that is not how this is going to fucking work. This is the system here, and the system does storylines. So I just don't see a scenario where anyone in this X division here, which again is a bullshit. It's it's a lightweight division. They're, they're going to try to throw some people in there. Oh, I mean, Tom Hannafin is going to jerk off every episode over th- there not being w- uh, weight limits for the X division. But they're going to throw all these little guys at him. The Laredo kids of the world, Jonathan Gresham, uh, probably not Alan Angels because he, he's, a, he's a heel. You can't even throw the big X division guys against him because they're heels. I don't even know who I don't, it, it, I don't. I'm like thinking in my head here. I'm like, I don't even know who's going to wrestle Moose to begin with. But none of these guys are going to beat him. He's not putting Leon Slater over. I'm Leon Slater is one of those guys who's going to win the title in an Ultimate X, or he's gonna he's gonna win it into in some multi person match. That's how he's gonna win. I just don't see there there being a storyline feud where he beats Moose. I think what's more likely is that the next guy that another company fires who you know someone who used to wrestle in wwe who used to wrestle in AEW, that comes over um that takes takes that mustafa ali spot i think that's who ultimately beats moose i don't i don't know who that is going to be but i just don't see it being anyone on the roster i have a hard time believing that if it's leon slater awesome you know um there's just there's no one that can beat Moose on this roster unless there's, you know, if they put like, if they do something where, um, it, it's like no disqualification, or there's just like no rules, or it's some kind of street fight, or or something along those lines, and where you just you 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 create a scenario where you get an easy out because there's just like I said, there's just no rules. I can see you getting there and beating Moose, but I just I I am prepared for a very long title run here because there's only so many titles you can give this fucking stable at this point. And again, the system works best when someone has a belt. And I think the next step in the system is disbanding them once Moose loses the X Division Championship. I think at that point, it's going to be like ah, it's going to be kind of hard to keep titles on these guys. That's just my my opinion, unless JDC wins the digital media championship or something, which which could still happen. They might they might enter, you know, they might add that title to the group. So it looks looks like they've got something. So we'll see. But I, I really don't think anyone on the roster right now can beat Moose. I think he's gonna be the X Division champion for the majority of next year. I think Masha next year. Um Ash by Elegance and Heather Wright Elegance will probably be champions for the majority of the year. What other titles we got? The Digital Media Championship, that's probably the one that's going to 
switch hands quite a bit over the year, but that belt means nothing. The world title, Joe Hendry's going to win it, but you know they're trying to put the belt on Mike Santana. So I don't think Joe Hendry's going to have a long title run because he's a mid-card wrestler that's popular. I think they're going to get the title on him because that's what the people want. But I think it's going to be like a WWE situation with Daniel Bryan where it's like, okay, we're going to put the belts on him, but he's not really our champion, and we're going to beat him as soon as we possibly can. Kind of like what they did with CM Punk at one point before he got you know, too popular as a babyface. So that's kind of what I think they're going to do. I think they're going to put the title on Joe Hendry. He's going to have the title for a couple months, and then they're going to put on the person they really want is uh, Mike Santana. That's going to do it for me this week, folks. We will talk some TNA Impact again next week. But for now, I'm your boy BQ, and I am out. Peace.